This is a brief presentation on pyelonephritis. It has been prepared by Alex, Caitlin, and Craig. We are going to start off with a brief review of anatomy. You can see our pictures here. Uh, this first picture is an anterior view of a female. You can see the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. The next picture is a lateral view of a male. Again, you can see the kidney, the ureter, bladder, and urethra. These two pictures are good for helping us to orient ourselves with regards to the location of the organs in the urinary tract. The next picture is a larger or a zoomed in picture of the kidney. Uh, this one's good because you can see all of the structures pertaining to the kidney. We're going to specifically be talking about the renal pelvis since this is the site of ascending inflammation that we are focusing on in pyelonephritis. So let's go ahead and we'll move on and we'll discuss the etiology of pyelonephritis. Um, pyelonephritis, simply put, is an infection in a kidney. This infection can be caused in many different ways. The most common cause is a bladder or a urethral infection, a UTI in other words. These infections can travel up the urinary tract infection and often localize in the renal pelvis causing that inflammation. Uh, other pathways include blockage of the urinary tract. This can be due to prostate enlargement or kidney stones among other things catheter use, cytoscopy, and surgical or surgery involving the urinary tract are other common ways to introduce, pa introduce pathogens into the urinary tract. Um, infection of the kidney can lead to scarring and can damage the kidney and thus impair the proper functioning of the kidneys. Sepsis or acute renal failure can also result from a severe case of pyelonephritis. Other complications, such as renal papillary necrosis, abscesses, and emphysematous formation or gas in the tissues can also occur. Frequent infections of the kidney or severe cases can lead to chronic kidney disease. A subset of E. coli called uropathogenic E. coli or extraintestinal pathogenic E. coli causes most of the clinical cases of pyelonephritis. So now we're going to move on and we'll talk about some of the signs and symptoms. So we're going to start off here talking about the typical presentation of pyelonephritis. These are most of the patients. And remember, patients are all different, so they can present with any number of these signs and symptoms. So we have fever, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, back, side, and groin pain, urgent, frequent urination, pain or burning during urination, pus and or blood in the urine, and CVA or costovertebral angle tenderness. So those are the normal signs and symptoms. We also have here some special cases. Um, the first one here is the presentation of pyelonephritis in an infant. Again, infants cannot talk and so they're, they're going to be kind of abstract. They can have a fever and they're probably going to present with difficulty feeding and so that's not very much to go on in making a diagnosis of pyelonephritis. Uh, it's, it's similar with elderly patients. They can present with a fever and they can also have mental status changes. Again, not very much to go on and not very telling of pyelonephritis. Uh, because these things are fairly abstract, um, there are no consistent signs or symptoms that are pathognomonic for pyelonephritis. Because of that, providers should have a high index of suspicion for pyelonephritis. So we need to try and keep those things in mind. Um, next, let's move on to the diagnosis of pyelonephritis. The diagnosis is made with a urine test to identify bacteria and formations of white blood cells which are called casts and they're shaped like tubes and those are found in the kidneys. Um, if an infection cannot be easily cured, x-rays might be done to look for abnormalities in the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder. Uh, next let's go ahead and we'll move on to the treatment. So this is, um, this is the meat of the presentation. Um, we're going to focus in on three different types of treatment. The first is presumptive, the, septi the second is acute, and the last is ongoing. Um, so for the presumptive patient here, we have two different patient groups. This first patient group is the group that has mild to moderate symptoms and uncomplicated disease. So we have our first line treatment, which is oral antibiotic therapy. The nice thing about treating these patients is we need to remember that the risk of not treating an infection far outweighs the risk of antibiotic therapy or treating a patient with antibiotics without pyelonephritis. 
Um, so we do have our primary options for treatment. The primary options, there's two of them. The first is cefixamine, and the dose on that is 400 milligrams orally once daily for two weeks. The second treatment is ciprofloxacin. Uh, that can be that is 500 milligrams orally twice daily for one to two weeks. And then we have some secondary options. Those two options are here, and those two are levofloxacin and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And that's a mixture of two different drugs. So those are our secondary options. And then we're going to move on to our second patient group under the title of presumptive. And this patient group are those patients who have severe symptoms, complicated disease, or those patients who are pregnant. So our first line treatment for those patients is hospitalization and IV antibiotics. So we do have some indications here for hospitalization. So if your patients have any of these, you might consider hospitalization. Dehydration, fever, that's over 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Patients who have a high white blood cell count, sepsis, patients with multiple comorbidities, and those patients who are older or immunocompromised. Uh, treatment for those patients, we have our primary options. The first option is ceftriaxone, and that dose is one gram intravenously once daily. And then our second option is ciprofloxacin, and the dose on that is 200 to 400 milligrams intravenously every 12 hours. And then we've got some secondary options. Um, those two are, there's two of them. The first one is levofloxacin, and the second is piperacillin tazobactam. Again, that's a mixture. Okay, so that takes care of those patients that are presumptive, those patients that we think have pyelonephritis. Our next patient group here is the acute pyelonephritis patient. So we're going to focus in, um, the acute patient group is those who have mild to moderate symptoms with uncomplicated disease. And our first-line treatment for those with acute pyelonephritis who have mild to moderate symptoms is targeted oral antibiotic therapy. So again, we have two primary options. The first one is cefixime, and that dose is 400 milligrams orally once daily for two weeks. And the second is ciprofloxacin, and the dose there is 500 milligrams orally twice daily for one to two weeks. We do have some secondary options. And those two secondary, there's two of them, those two secondary options are levofloxacin and tri trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Okay, so then our next patient group in the acute patients is the acute patient who has severe symptoms, complicated disease, or is pregnant. So we have our first line treatment, and that is again targeted IV antibiotic therapy. So for those patients who are hospitalized who have um, these severe symptoms, they should show improvement in 48 to 72 hours. The treatment course for them is about two weeks, and with improvement, the patient's regime can be changed to an oral antimicrobial therapy. Um, and so we have our primary options for those patients as far as our treatment. The first is ceftriaxone, and the dose there is one gram intravenously once daily. And then we have ciprofloxacin, the dose there is 400 milligrams intravenously every 12 hours. We do have some secondary options for those patients, and those are levofloxacin and piperacillin tazobactam. So that takes care of our acute patients. Now let's move on to our patients who are ongoing, or those patients who have chronic pyelonephritis. Um, so our patient group is recurrent disease within one to two weeks of the first exacerbation. So our first-line treatment for these patients is going to be culture and sensitivity-directed antibiotic therapy. So our primary options are cefixime, and the dose there is 400 milligrams orally once daily for two weeks. And the second option is ciprofloxacin, and the dose there is 500 milligrams orally twice daily for one to two weeks. And then we do have some secondary options for these chronic patients as well, and the, those are levofloxacin and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And then lastly, we have credits here where we got our information from, and that's it.